2007. Um, and actually, I've seen her um, uh, in numerous different places working on the issue. And somebody said, Candy said, she rocks. I think both of them rock, and they're going to give us some great information about what's going on. Thanks. just make this make Frank speak Ojibwe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, prior to 2011, um, the Minnesota Indian Women Sexual Assault Coalition um, started gathering data from about 105 Native American women. And they came out with a report called the Garden of Truth. And in that um, Garden of Truth report, they came up with some statistics. Um, these were 105 women had either been trafficked or were currently being trafficked. And one of the things that came out of that report was that um, people, of, women of color, were being trafficked at disproportionately higher rates than non, um, women of non-color. So the following statistics were found, that 79% of women that were interviewed had been sexually abused by children by an average of four perpetrators. Also, 92% had been raped. I worked in a couple of um, male-dominated positions, and there's a comment that I've heard over and over again, and it's, um, and I'm sure a lot of you men have heard it too, that you can't rape the willing. And women who have been prostituted are by far not willing participants in prostitution, by far. 84% um, have been physically assaulted in prostitution. 98% were currently or previously homeless. Um, that's an entry point also for women going into prostitution, that sometimes how their boyfriends um, get them there is they're looking for a place to stay. 48% um, have been used by 200 sex buyers during their lifetimes, and another 16% have been used by at least 900 sex buyers. And racism was an emotionally damaging element in these women's lives and a source of ongoing stress. 62% of these Native women saw a connection between prostitution and colonization and explained that the devaluation of women in prostitution was identical to the devaluation of Native people and historical trauma. Thank you, Patty. <coughs> All tough with her cast today. Yeah, if you haven't heard, she dropped her Harley on her foot. That's why she's in the cast. So, <clears throat> so when she reads those statistics, they're shocking to me still as many times as I've read this. When we did the Garden of Truth report, 105 Native, adult Native women from the state of Minnesota, over half of those women were from Duluth and this Duluth area. So these statistics that we read are really real for right here, right now. And that report was released in 2011, so it wasn't, it's not that long ago, and it's still going on. And um, realizing that women of color, Native women are disproportionately represented um, as targets for being trafficked, and that they know this. This report was interviews from women um, interviews that went an hour and a half to three hours. These are the voices of women in their actual experience. And so they saw that. And the women in the report could speak articulately about um, how race played a role in violence perpetrated against them. You know, saying that some of the male purchasers of these women, you know, would say things like, oh, you're Indian, I thought we killed you all. You know, or playing out gross like Pocahontas, John Smith fantasies. So there is definitely um, a racial tie to this. And according to that report, 78% of the men who bought these women were Caucasian men that purchased them. And so um, when I say that, <coughs> not to get a room of Caucasian men very angry at me, but I say that because there is an invisibility element. Because we think about how can this go on here? You know, I'm a lifelong Twin Ports resident. I live in Cloquet. You know, I work in Duluth. This is my area. This is my home. And you think, how can this be happening here? 
um, how can we not see this? And think about it yourself, like, when I say prostitute, what picture comes into your head? You know, you think of the woman in a mini skirt and the fishnet tights and, you know, brazen attitude, hey baby, screaming, that's what we think of, right? Because of awesome movies like Pretty Woman that Candy talked about, you know? And um, so there's 105 women so over 50 of them came to be interviewed. And during these interviews, there were so many women, we actually had to turn women away because there wasn't enough time to interview. So this is just a sampling of the population. So if we're thinking of that, we don't see it, right? You don't really see women dressed like that on the streets in Duluth not just because it's freezing outside, but because that's not the reality. A trafficked woman looks like me. A trafficked Native woman looks like Patty, like Tina, like Janice. You know, they look just like us. And so as a community, what we need to do is see them. Because with this research, there's a researcher, her name is Melissa Farley, and she has done the same research in nine different countries, some of which are third world countries. And when we compared the data between Native American women in the state of Minnesota to these women in nine different countries, across the board, the conditions were worse in Minnesota for these women when it came to violence being perpetrated against them, how violent the acts were, how, um, how many times they were raped, how many people died. You know, the conditions were worse here. And so that's a reality to think about is that we need to see these women. Candy said the average age of entry is between 12 and 14 years old. So let's split the difference, we'll say 13. So she enters prostitution, is forced, fraud, or coerced in some way or other into prostitution at 13. So we call it child abuse because we can agree a 13 year old is not a willing participant in this. So 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, it's child abuse, and all of a sudden at 18, it becomes a sexually liberated job choice. That does not make sense. And we look at these statistics, the st statistics that Patty just gave, that the women are, you know, um, abused um, as children, sexually abused, they may be in foster homes or some other kind of trauma, and we see trauma being perpetrated against them. But what we need to do is stop thinking, what's wrong with these women? What happened to them? Why do they do this? And we need to start thinking of, why does that man think it's okay to buy another human being? We need to think like that. You know, I'm gonna tell a quick story, and lots of people have heard this story before, but it, it really, um, it made an impact on me. I am married to a Chmukaman, and if you don't, there's a new word for you, Frank. If you don't know that word, that means white guy. And he's six foot seven, he's a factory worker, he's your regular kind of guy. And um, sometimes, believe it or not, I'll come home hot when I learn something that makes me really angry, and who do we take it out on? our husbands and so I'll come home and I'm like oh you won't believe what I just heard ah, I can't believe this this makes me so angry and he's a very good man and a very good husband and so he goes uh-huh okay mm -hmm. yes dear would you like some tea you know and so I figured he's not really listening to me he's just letting me get it all out and then one day I'm at work and he calls me which is weird and because the factory is usually so loud that he can't hear his phone, he said, hey, hey, babe, I need some of those statistics. So I like put the phone here and I start typing in Vikings football, thinking it's for his fantasy league. I'm like, okay, what do you need? And he said, you know, strip clubs where men think women want to be there, but someone's really hurting them and they're probably getting sold some of that stuff. Like, okay, I'll, okay, I'll text you some of that stuff. He's like, okay, it breaks down, I gotta go. So then I text him some of that. I had no idea that he was going to a bachelor party that night. 
and convince the guys at the bachelor party to go to a sports bar and play darts and educated. Now those guys will not go near me because they think I'm a man-hating feminazi <laughs> that will eat them alive if they say the wrong thing to me. Company picnics and stuff, I'm alone at my table because they all know the kind of work I do. But they did listen to him and they, they just changed their mind. They didn't patronize a strip club that night. And that makes a difference. That makes those women visible to those men. And it's not radical. He's never going to come to a protest with me, carrying signs, being all loud. He just changed his circle and made, made it so those women were not something to be purchased, but they were human beings. You know, and um, so when you think of what can I do, change your circle. See these women. That's something you can do. You know, and we have elected officials in the audience, so of course I've got to take this minute and talk to you all and say that, you know, we urge you as state, local, or tribal officials to review and reconsider your policies towards victims of prostitution and trafficking and include the research that's been done in our state. The arrests and prosecution of victims is counterproductive and exacerbates their problems. We call it violence against women. We talk about it as violence against women. But if we arrest them, are we saying that as a community? You know, and as one Native woman from the Garden of Truth report said, we need people with hearts. So arresting sex buyers and not the victims is a more appropriate policy. Thank you.